plus X-Men fans, we're here, kind of. The X-Men are kind of in the MCU, uh, but we have at least the first two episodes of X-Men 97. This has been billed as a continuation of the classic Fox series, which created a lot of X-Men fans back in the day uh, and made it one of the uh, properties that, you know, Marvel was able to sell off when they were having trouble with bankruptcy, uh, in that case, to Fox. Uh, and, you know, the movies, the Fox movies were incredible. I mean, Ryan Reynolds is about to cash in on them in a big way. Uh, but, you know, this was supposed to be to pick up right up where that series left off. Uh, I don't really think it feels that way at all. Uh, I, I wonder what you think. But to me, while the vibe is amazing, like, amazing so much stuff for us to discuss this is like really interesting stuff and this show is definitely made by people who love the x-men as much as we do but the writing the writing i would actually say is non-existent it's like i would say x-men 97 plays more like a cliff notes version of the x-men with fans of the comics like myself constantly getting excited when they do the thing but then they don't really do the thing. You're like, oh, okay. I mean, it's like, we know where it would go, but somebody who is not familiar with these classic stories would just be like, and then what happens? And it's like, go read the comics. I wish, I wish that they had links to go read the comics if this was the direction they were gonna take because they just, they just leave you hanging. The show moves at a ridiculously fast pace. It seems very much like a soap opera, which, the classic X-Men comics were like, uh, but you know, like almost like a spoof of a soap opera in many ways. X-Men 97, I think they should have called it X-Men Greatest Hits, right? Or X-Men Telenova. That's kind of more what it seems like to me. Now, the X-Men have always been a very progressive comic. It was so weird to see some criticism of that with this new series on uh, social media, because that's what the X-Men are. I mean, they've always been a stand-in for different groups that have had to fight for their rights. You know, the Holocaust, civil rights, uh, LGBT. And then I thought it was really interesting and fit perfectly that this show has added immigrants as well with some of the signs that you saw outside of the UN in episode two. Uh, but never before, while it's been representative of those groups, never before has the X-Men leaned so much into that mindset, which I personally, find fascinating. I think that's a really interesting and smart thing to do, but I don't know if it's going to, you know, narrow the appeal of the, of the characters. Uh, but I thought that they very much had that mindset in terms of story and visuals. As I tweeted, and as we discussed on the live stream, it's very euphoria, right? January 6th, there's are like, wait a minute, is this play about us? <laughs> uh, bold move, X-Men 97. Uh, you know, you know, Let's just say bold move. Now, Euphoria is a successful show, of course. Uh, one has won a ton of awards, has definitely become a part of the pop culture zeitgeist or whatever, right? Uh, but it's not a Game of Thrones. It's not a Last of Us, which is also a very LGBT show, by the way. Uh, and it's not MCU. It's not Fox X-Men movies. It's a smaller audience. So from a business, I mean, creatively, I think it's brilliant. From a business perspective, I'm not sure. Uh, we'll see how it does, we'll see. Now, this could just be something they decide to do for the animated series, and then that, would, that maybe would work. But I do wonder if this is Feige kind of tipping his hand as to the direction he plans to go for the characters or the team in the live action movies. Uh, we'll see, I mean, again, we'll see. Uh, although I have to say the stuff that we're seeing in Deadpool and Wolverine seems pretty uh, you know, pretty much like the original films, you know, a little, you know, so, well, I don't know. I mean, I think, uh, but still Ryan Reynolds has done a good job evolving it to today. You know, some really great jokes. Um, you know, I think they're definitely on the same scale, this show in Deadpool and Wolverine. Uh, it's just Ryan Reynolds is very good with, he has, he has, he has a very uh, sharp business hat. Now, it is weird to watch, speaking of the MCU, it's very weird to watch a Marvel show uh, that does not even pretend 
to tie into the MCU. I mean, lately, some of these shows have not at all tied into the MCU, uh, but at least they've, they've kind of said they were going to. You know, this one is, has nothing to do with the MCU. This is totally in its own space. And while I was watching, they only gave us the first three episodes for the press. And when I was watching the first three episodes, part of me, you know, I really wondered, what was the point of this show? Comic book fans like you and me, if you're, if you're a fellow comic book fan like myself, you already know these stories and they're not retelling them so we don't get to re-experience them. And if you don't know the stories, they're not teaching them to you or introducing them to you. So, I, I mean, one season is fun, you know, to celebrate the X-Men and, and to call back to this iconic series. Uh, but, you know, three, of this, three, I mean, they've already done apparently two seasons and they have a whole nother one coming. I think it would have to get cons it would have to slow down considerably to make that decision seem to make sense. But one reason for X Men '97 to exist, for sure, is to repair Cyclops's image. And boy, do they ever! Oh, the Cyclops love on this show is phenomenal. It's been a long time coming. So most moviegoers, if you're only familiar with the X Men Fox movies, right? Uh, he's just a lame foil to Wolverine. Uh, which really annoyed all of us who are comic book fans. Uh, so here's hoping, by the way, that James Marsden gets the chance to correct that injustice with a, a Deadpool and Wolverine cameo. Maybe, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. He uh, recently hinted at it himself. Uh, but comic book fans, again, we know what a great character this is. The leader of the X-Men. He's supposed to be a genuine, you know... Uh, yin, yin and yang to Wolverine. And so the whole balance of the comic is off if you don't have that. Uh, and more than ever here, he is such a Saturday morning cartoon leading man. I thought he was having some G.I. Joe vibes at times too. It was phenomenal. I mean, if you are even the slightest Cyclops fan, it's, there, there's a lot here for you to be excited about. Maybe it'll make some new Cyclops fans. And with his incredible action moments, how can you not be won over? Particularly, ah, when he demonstrates, I mean, when he entered into that Friends of Humanity uh, warehouse, that was cool. That was really cool. But I was just blown away when he demonstrated how he did not need a parachute. Thank you very much. And he went right into superhero landing, speaking of Deadpool. I mean, it was gorgeous. I was like, hey, isn't anyone going to help Cyclops? What? That's fantastic. Uh, wow. I mean, everybody on the sideline was just swoon, right? I mean, it was amazing. On that note, another reason to watch X-Men 97 are the amazing visuals. So back in the day, X-Men, like when it was really firing on all cylinders, X-Men trading cards were quite the rage, right? So there's a huge thing. X I mean, I, uh, trading cards were, of course, big overall, but X-Men really utilized them well. And I think this show has what you would call, or I'd call, trading card moments, where a member of the team really gets to shine in an action moment, almost like it's a hologram trading card. Like it's not even a full action scene. They just kind of like walk the action runway, right? We're gonna talk about the uh, We're gonna talk about the outfits and Hellfire Gala influence. All right, so in addition to Cyclops' moment, Storm gets two herself, one in each episode. Thank goodness she gets a chance to shine before they take her powers away. We're gonna talk about that. And I thought Jubilee, just dancing with her powers, was one of the coolest, most hypnotic animation sequences I've ever seen. It reminded me of those really cool, like, animated Don Bluth movies in the 70s, where you were like, what are you doing? That's incredible. Can we get Zemo in here? MCU dance party. Uh, Magneto and Jean Grey get some big moments as well, but for me, the colors of their powers are wrong. Now, I know they're accurate to the original series, but I don't care. As an X-Men comic book fan, Jean's powers are pink and Magneto's powers are blue. So I really can't stand in the show when they don't have the right color powers. It's Again, I know it's from the animated series, but it's driving me crazy. Magneto's doesn't match his outfit even. I just, I can't stand it. I mean, the power set is supposed to, the power colors are supposed to match the outfit so that you can clearly see where they're coming from. I mean, it's clear visual rules and I hates it. All right, so yeah. So some, let's talk fashion. Some bold fashion choices here. You know which ones I'm talking about. What do you think? Like Magneto's are based on the comic, but are much more glam here. Wow, they really zhuzhed. Uh, uh, I'm not quite sure what term is the right one to use, but wow, 
right? Like Tim Gunn would be like, ooh, interesting. Uh, to me, I think this comes from the influence of the current comics where they have the annual Hellfire Gala, which is really the Met Gala for mutants. Now, I know some fans love the Met Gala. I thought it was very clever when it was first introduced. But, and you know, by the way, they had a real life one at Comic-Con. I think it was last year or something. And a lot of fans showed up and to their credit, really brought it, really brought their A game. I was very impressed, but I still don't like it in the comics anymore. I thought once was fun, but ever since I'm like, eh, you know, I mean, it just doesn't work for me. I think it's a distraction. I think it slows the story down. There's usually, it's a lot like the show actually. That's fascinating. You know, more talking and drama than action, you know? Uh, so I don't know. I, I mean, it depends. I guess if you really like the current comics and the Hellfire Gala stuff, maybe you think the series song is just fine, perfectly fine the way it is. So what do you think of some of the more bold fashion choices that were made here? And then what also when it comes to the comics, this is this show is also a very strong nod, even stronger in fact, you know what, I guess it's kind of like in the middle, but very much a strong nod to the class. I'm, and it might, it might, the danger of that is that you please nobody, but it also has a very strong nod to the classic iconic Chris Claremont, Jim Lee era. This cover, the most famous X-Men cover still to this day, very much this show. Uh, you know, and the animated, well, the animated series, interestingly, the original one was like an all ages version of the X-Men, but this is an adult version, very much like the comic. And, uh, I, but it, I, I wonder if people will realize that. I mean, this is not a show. This is not an all ages show. I mean, the comic was never, X-Men's not an all ages comic. Uh, but it's weird because the original animated series was. All right, so anyway, back to the Claremont Lee stuff. All the group activities that the team is always doing, like playing team sports and having big meals together. Wait till you see them go swimming into the beach and have a cookout. They did all that stuff. Uh, by the way, that's a lot of beignet per person gambit. I'm like, two of three tops be a gambit. You can't have a whole meal of beignet. I mean, Gambit's, Gambit's not eating those beignets. He's just trying to make everybody else uh, uh, eat all those beignets so he can look even more fierce next to them. <laughs> I'm on to your game, Gambit. And also, I thought Scott, uh, Scott setting the table was a cute touch. I thought that was nice. These are the kind of dynamics that they used to show this way in the, in the Claremont uh, Lee era. The Claremont Lee comics were very soap opery with lots of personal drama, including plenty of love triangles. Uh, before Scott, by the way, had a cr uh, got involved with Emma Frost, he had a crush on Psylocke, uh, for those of you who aren't aware of that. Psylocke only shows up very briefly. We'll talk about her in a minute. Uh, the movies, though, only really did one love, tri love triangle, the Scott Jean Logan one, and that really wasn't a triangle, right? Because one corner was, was unfairly lame. I hadn't expected to see as much romance as they have here. I was like, I mean, let's just call it romance, but I was like, whoa, a lot of sexy time on this show. Wow. But again, so in line with the comics, which were not all ages. So they, they're really, I guess they really feel like that's the only, I mean, it's on Disney Plus. I would think you try and have a little bit more broader appeal to create new X-Men fans, but they're just trying to, I think, uh, impress the ones who, you know, who liked the uh, animated series. Now, the show is going along so quickly story-wise that most characters aren't getting a lot of screen time individually. I would say that in these first two episodes, despite having a huge cast, the only ones that really get a chance to shine are Scott, Gene, Storm, and Magneto. Uh, aren't these graphics cool, by the way? So X-Men. And very trading card, again, I love it. Uh, again, you know, the writing is weak, but the people who made the show understand X-Men fandom and culture. Uh, Gambit, of course, stands out thanks to, again, him owning that outfit. And I love the change of having Bishop's veins and his arms go hot pink when he activates his powers. He needed that glow up. That's great. I would love to see that adapted in the live action and in the comics as well. It's very surprising that they gave such little screen time to Wolverine and Rogue, who were huge fan favorites on the original show. And I wonder how fans will react to that. And apparently, Morph is here to be Mr. Cameo, although I would still rather have Mystique. Miss Mystique, where are the X-Men bitches? We need them. All right, so with these, uh, although we kind of get one next week, you'll see. All right, so with these two episodes, we got uh, Archangel, AKA Apocalypse version of Angel, 
the blob in an overcomplicated fastball special. I was like, why does it morph just turn into Colossus and do the fastball special right? And I agree with everybody on the internet, this move would make Wolverine explode. That's how Gambit's powers work, thank you. Then in episode two, Lady Deathstrike, who for a minute I forgot it was morph. I was like, how'd she get here? Colossus, there he is. And my favorite, my favorite cameo in these two episodes from Morph, Psylocke. Not only was the animation with her particularly fluid, flip that hair, baby, but she, she was a staple of the Claremont Lee era. I believe, I believe they introduced her, right? Very cool. Uh, so who are they fighting here? That's the Executioner, get it? X, right? Uh, visually, right out of the comics, but with pretty much none of his story. You don't learn anything about him. He's from Friends of Humanity. That's it. Uh, it's just ridiculous That's how little they do with him. So let's talk story. Again, there's very little here. Uh, well, very little depth or nuance. I mean, there's a lot of, as I said, bullet points, X-Men cliff notes, greatest hits. And then, of course, plenty of drama. So Magneto is now leading the X-Men thanks to Charles Xavier's will, which, where was it? Isn't there a lawyer that Charles had that they can double check with? I wouldn't just take Magneto's word for it and some document he showed up with, which just happens to be in a metal book or whatever. And then in episode two, he's leading the X-Men and he gets his own title card. He gets his very own title card and he go not only does he have a title card, but it's first up. I couldn't believe it. Ah, uh, I figured he'd have to give one doozy of a speech to be acquitted of all his crimes against humanity. I was like, all right, Magneto, let's hear it. And the speech is pretty good. It's the best writing in these two episodes. But really, he couldn't give a good enough speech to just be pardoned for, the, for what he said. I mean, and the, that's not even what the show does to its credit. He, I mean, they go through that, they allow him to have his big speech, but he's pardoned for very realistic reasons, right? Uh, as a thank you for not killing the United, the United Nations Council. And then also because humanity needs him if he's willing to fight for them. Throughout history, government agencies have been willing to work with reformed criminals. Just watch Catch Me If You Can. Uh, and then, of course, uh, other more serious examples, of course, exist. Uh, I thought it was clever to have Sunspot be kind of like the new Jubilee, uh, as the very first episode of the original series featured Jubilee, running away and being saved by the X-Men and, and brought onto the team, you know, as the entry point for the viewer, uh, which they even, you know, Jubilee even says that here, but they never did that. I mean, they had the setup, but then they just kind of dropped it. They were like, clever, huh? And we were like, ah, oh, yeah. And then they were like, well, that's like, again, that's the show in a nutshell. They were like, pretty good idea, huh? And you were like, yeah. And then they're like, all right, let's move on. And you're like, are you going to do the idea? And they're like, nah, you get it. And you're like, I kind of do. Uh, Sunspot, by the way, hasn't even earned his title card. All right, then Friends of, Hu Friends of Humanity and the Sentinel stories were pretty secondary, right? Extremely rushed. They were like, we're done. And you were like, oh, okay. With this show, again, favoring personal drama instead. They're really just excuses to have like an action sequence. But you know, the action sequence is again, it's half a, half a fashion show, half, half runway swerve, red carpet. Uh, with episode two, I can't believe Jean had her baby already. Wow, that's Cable, by the way. Uh, oh boy, is it Cable. Uh, that's all I'll say. Uh, nice touch with Rogue delivering the baby by absorbing the doctor's abilities. They didn't show what happened to the doctor. Uh, in the comics, Rogue got control of her powers eventually, and that turned out to be the biggest mistake one of the biggest mistakes they ever made in the comics. Just totally ruined the character. I'm surprised they never retconned it, or at least had her have a horrible accident where she went back to not being able to control her powers. Like back in the day, Rogue and Gambit could not have been more popular. And these days, no one cares. They just announced they're gonna try and do something with them again. And I'm telling you, I don't think it's gonna work. Uh, then of course, the big headline is that Storm loses her powers. What the what? She jinxed herself, by the way, by telling Jean she sometimes wonders what it's like to be human. Oh no, now you're gonna find out. I know she's a hero, but that she took that shot for Magneto? It just seemed like too much to me. I was like, trying to stop it, Storm, but putting yourself in front of it, well, what? And so she left, she didn't even keep her lightning bolt earrings. She felt she could no longer wear them, so sad. But don't worry, Storm fans. All I'll say is she won't be gone for long. And then finally, the big finale, so we had the big headline and then the big finale, 
Another gene? The look on the on the on the on the, the gene that we've been with his face was hilarious, by the way. The animators did a nice job. Because she not only looked surprised, but annoyed, which I thought was funny. Uh, and again, ridiculously fast. Just two episodes in, and instead of you would think you think the focus of the first two episodes would just be Magneto leading the team. Like that's just would be it. Dealing with Charles Xavier's death and Magneto leading the team and kind of reintroducing audiences through Sunspot to the group. That should be the first two episodes. But no! Magneto's in the team, Sunspot. But then on top of that, Executioner, Friends of Humanity, The Trial of Magneto, um, you know, Jean Grey has her baby, Storm loses her powers, there's another Jean! I mean, it's nuts. It's nuts, as I said. It's soap opera rules. So we'll see if that works for him. So, uh, and I can tell you, I've only seen three episodes, but it has, so far, through three, had, it has not changed. All right, so what do you think? Share your thoughts down below. Thank you for going over this with me. Uh, are you a fellow X-Men a diehard fan, or are you new to the party? Uh, and what do you think as the X-Men kind of entered the MCU? Share your thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.